Myocardial Infarction, presented by Group 6. Hello everyone, my name is Hiba Hanna and today me and my group, group number six, we will be presenting to you on the myocardial infarction, beginning with the overview of the disease. The myocardial infarction, which is also called the heart attack, is an irreversible damage to the myocardial tissue, which makes up the myocardium or the heart muscle. And this damage is due to the prolonged ischemia and hypoxia, which means a reduced blood oxygen flow and blood flow to the coronary arteries. This can be caused by atherosclerosis or an occlusion of the artery by an embolus or a thrombosis. Moving on to the types, infarctions are categorized according to the anatomic region where they occur from the left ventricle as follows. They can be anterior, posterior, lateral, septal, circumfrational, and a combination of whichever type above. Moving on to the etiology of the disease, some causes and risk factors that put the individual in a greater risk of developing myocardial infarction are smoking, hypertension, drug and alcohol use, obesity, stress, stress age, gender, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, which is high LDL or low density lipids, a family history of the disease, and chronic kidney disease. Moving on to the pathophysiology of the disease, myocardial infarction is caused by the occlusion of one or multiple large epicardial coronary arteries that last for more than 40 minutes. The occlusion itself is caused by a plaque that split it and ruptured. This leads to lack of blood supply and oxygen supply, causing irreversible structural and myocardial changes to myocardium tissue. This prolonged change eventually results in necrosis to subendocardium and the subepicardium layers. The cardiac function is compromised according to which layer is damaged, and the myocardium tissue has a low capacity of regeneration, and it does by forming scar tissue. The scar tissue causes the heart to be remodeled, and this is characterized by dilation, segmental hypertrophy of remaining viable tissue, and cardiac dysfunction as a result, which leads to the infarction and heart attack. Diagnostic tests. Some non-invasive diagnostic tests include an EKG, which records electrical activity of the heart, including timing and duration of each electrical phase of the heartbeat. It determines if a heart attack has occurred. It helps predict if a heart attack is developing and monitors the changes in heart rhythm. Ambulatory electrocardiogram and Holter monitor records, documents, and describes abnormal ac electrical activity in the heart during daily activities to help doctors determine the condition of the heart and the best possible treatments. A chest x-ray takes a picture of the heart, lungs, and bones of the chest and determines whether a heart attack has enlarged the heart or if fluid is accumulating in the lungs as a result of a heart attack. An echocardiogram uses a handheld device which is placed on the chest that uses high frequency sound waves ultrasound to produce images of the heart size, structure, and motion. Cardiac computer tomography, computer imaging, refers to several non-invasive diagnostic imaging tests that uses computer-aided techniques to gather images of the heart. A computer creates a 3D image that can show blockages caused by calcium deposits in coronary arteries. Exercise stress test, also known as a treadmill test. It's a monitor with electrodes that are attached to the skin on the chest area to record your heart function while you are on a treadmill. It evaluates heart rate, breathing, and blood pressure. It also evaluates how tired you become during exercise and helps doctors determine a safe level of exercise. The thallium stress test is similar to the exercise stress test. However, in this test, a radioactive substance called thallium is injected into the bloodstream, and when a patient is at maximum exercise level, a special gamma camera takes a picture of the heart's muscle cells, and it measures the flow of the heart muscle at rest and during stress. It also can determine the extent of damage of a heart attack and a safe level of exercise. Some invasive diagnostic tests include blood tests. By testing levels of cardiac enzymes, including troponin, creatine kinase, C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, 
lipoproteins, triglycerides, BNP, and prothrombin confirm that a heart attack has occurred and the extent of the damage. They also assess for future risk of coronary artery disease and provide the time it takes for blood to clot. Cardiac catheterization exam examines the inside of the heart's blood vessels by using special x-rays called angiograms. A thin hollow tube called a catheter is threaded from the blood vessel in the arm, growing, or neck to the heart. Dye is injected to the catheter into the blood vessels to make them visible on the x-ray. It takes about two to three hours. They can measure the blood pressure in the heart, the oxygen level in the blood, valve function, and the best course of future treatment. Muscle and the functions of the valves and determine the, co the course of treatment. We know that MI is defined pathologically as myocardial cell death due to prolonged ischemia. But now let's take a look at some of the signs and symptoms that are presented when someone suffers an MI. The onset of myocardial ischemia is the initial step in the development of MI and results from an imbalance between oxygen supply and demand. This can present as pressure, tightness, or chest pain that may or may not radiate to the upper extremities most commonly on the left side. The pain may also radiate up the neck and jaw. Presence of epigastric discomfort, including pain, nausea, indigestion, or heartburn during exertion or at rest, as well as overwhelming dyspnea or fatigue. Patients have also reported a feeling of impending doom or an awareness that something life-threatening may be occurring. This event can also be accompanied by cold sweat, chills, and dizziness, or numerous combinations of the symptoms listed. Unfortunately, the occurrence of MI has been shown to significantly increase the likelihood of anxiety, depression, and overall emotional distress post-MI. And what's interesting is that the occurrence of mental health disparities hold a higher prevalence in female patients than in male patients. In terms of nursing care, this may signify the need to take a patient's gender-specific needs and interventions into account. Of course, age, ethnic and cultural differences, as well as previous mental health status will also be considered as part of the nursing care provided to these patients who have suffered a myocardial infarction. Here's a short video to elaborate on this occurrence. Are feelings of depression or anxiety common after a heart attack? The answer is definitely yes. We have this kind of rule of thumb that depression doubles your risk of having a heart attack, but heart attack also doubles your risk of developing depression. They are closely intertwined. They may actually share some risk factors. And the adaptation that occurs, the responses that occur in the aftermath of having a heart attack are understandable. We may feel anxious, concerned, low in mood after experiencing these major life events. So, very important to recognize them, seek out help, counsel from a professional or a peer, or some people will need medication or behavioral counseling. All of these are extremely helpful and can affect our long-term trajectory. The other thing that we know is that these symptoms improve over time. So as part of the rehabilitation program, we see that there is a dramatic reduction in our feelings of anxiety. So Dr. O mentions that these feelings of anxiety and depression following MI are common, but he also emphasizes that these symptoms can improve over time, by participation and mastery of the patient's own health and care. This is where we as nurses play a vital role in the form of patient education and patient empowerment by equipping them with the knowledge and resources to not only understand their condition, but also how to take care of themselves to prevent further events. We have the distinct privilege of coming face to face with our patients and enabling them to take control of their health following an MI by encouraging them to adhere to their new medication regimen with statin therapy, for example, adopting a low fat diet and putting them in contact with professionals that can help alleviate the depression and anxiety that may follow a myocardial infarction.
medical management. Some routine prophylactic therapies include aspirin, which is widely tolerated, but it should not be given to those with a known hypersensitivity, bleeding peptic ulcers, severe hepatic disease, and aspirin can sometimes trigger bronchospasms and asthmatics. Antiarrhythmic drugs can reduce the incidence of ventricular fibrillation in the acute phase of myocardial infarction, but can significantly increase the risk of asystole. Angiotensin-converting enzymes, ACE inhibitors, if started on the first day, reduce mortality in the succeeding four to six weeks. The use of ACE inhibitors early in acute myocardial infarction indicated that this therapy is safe and well tolerated. Nitrates have shown no significant reduction in mortality and therefore are not recommended. Calcium antagonist. There is no case for using calcium antagonists for prophylactic purposes in the acute phase of myocardial infarction. Beta blockers have been used in the acute phase of myocardial infarction because of their potential to limit infarct size, reduce the incidence of fatal arrhythmias, and to relieve pain. Magnesium and glucose insulin potassium, the benefits are questionable among experts, so they are not recommended. Non-invasive medical monitoring. Electrocardiographic monitoring for arrhythmias should be started immediately after any patient is suspected of having sustained an acute myocardial infarction. This should be continued for at least 24 hours or until alternative diagnosis has been made. Further ECG monitoring and arrhythmias is dependent upon the perceived risk to the patient and upon the equipment available. When a patient leaves the CCU, monitoring of rhythm may be continued if necessary by telemetry. More prolonged monitoring is appropriate for those who have sustained heart failure, shock, or serious arrhythmias in the acute phase as the risk of further arrhythmias is high. Monitoring the recovery of the ST segment deviations the first hours following admissions provides important prognostic information and may be helpful for selecting further treatment such as rescue PCI. Invasive medical monitoring. All coronary care units should have the skills and the equipment to perform invasive monitoring of the arterial and pulmonary artery pressures. Arterial pressure monitoring should be conducted on inpatients with cardiogenic shock. Balloon flotation catheters are of value for the assessment and care of patients with low cardiac output. They permit me measurement of right arterial, pulmonary artery, and pulmonary wedge pressures, and cardiac output. Balloon flotation catheters are used in the presence of cardiogenic shock, progressive heart failure, and suspected ventricular septal defect or papillary muscle dysfunction. We have Larry bringing in 67-year-old female chest pain. The situation is the following. Miss Barbara Lopez, 45-year-old female, came into the ER presenting with chest pain. She stated the pain came on suddenly about one hour ago. She claimed her chest felt tight and extremely heavy. She had never felt anything like this before. She also pointed out she felt pain in her jaw, which radiated to her left arm. Background. Mrs. Barbara Lopez is a Latino American woman with the history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Her medications is she's currently taking Lipitor 10 milligrams a day followed with her multivitamins one tablet. Assessment. Mrs. Barbara's vitals were the following. Her pain was reported 10 out of 10. Her blood pressure was 187 over 97 right arm. Her temperature was 98.7 Fahrenheit, which was taken orally. Her heart rate was 102 irregular. Her O2 stat was 90% room air. Her BMI was 38 and her respiration was 22 beats per minute labored breathing. Nursing Management As the video clip just revealed, Miss Barbara suffered a myocardial infarction. After closely assessing her, we have determined the appropriate nursing diagnosis as the following. 
acute pain related to myocardial tissue damage as evidenced by patient grimacing and reporting chest pain that radiates toward my jaw and down my left arm. Our short-term goal is that the patient will verbalize relief of chest pain within two hours. Our long-term goal is that the patient will recall three methods to reduce the risk for a future MI by discharge. The short-term interventions include monitor vitals and routinely assess pain using a culturally relevant self-report pain tool. Pain is subjective and is the most reliable indicator of pain presence and intensity. It's important to consider that clients from minority cultures may express pain differently from the majority culture. Altered vital signs may also be an indicator of pain. For example, elevated blood pressure is a typical sympathetic response to pain. Number two, administer oxygen and medications as ordered. Mona is a mnemonic that is used to remember treatment for MI. This includes oxygen to increase the amount available for myocardial uptake and thereby may relieve discomfort associated with tissue ischemia. Nitroglycerin for its vasodilating effect, which reduces preload and afterload and decreases myocardial oxygen demand while also promoting delivery of oxygen to the heart. Aspirin is used to prevent platelet activity that leads to thrombus formation. Morphine has potent analgesic effects and causes mild reductions in blood pressure and heart rate that reduce myocardial oxygen consumption. A 12-lead ECG should be performed within 10 minutes of emergency department arrival for all patients who are having chest discomfort. ECGs are used to identify the area of ischemia or injury. Number four. Teach patient non-pharmacological therapy techniques for pain management. Meditation, music therapy, and deep breathing help to elicit the relaxation response to decrease the effects of stress on pain. The long-term interventions include Number 1. Provide patient education for all prescribed medications. This includes the name, purpose and instruction on how to properly take the medication and possible side effects that may occur. The patient must understand and personally accept the value associated with the prescribed drug regimen to promote adherence. Number two, teach the patient the importance of physical activity as tolerated. Exercise is beneficial in the prevention of cardiovascular disease. Number three, educate the patient about a low sodium and low saturated fat diet. Keep in mind client education, literacy, health literacy level, and cultural considerations. Reducing risk factors acts as a secondary prevention of coronary artery disease. Number four, teach the patient about symptoms of ischemia, when to cease activity, and when to use sublingual nitroglycerin, and when to call 911. Patients and significant others need to be prepared to act quickly and decisively to relieve ischemic discomfort. Patient education. Before discharging Mrs. Barbara Lopez, we discussed the following. First off, we used the teach back method to assure she understood her condition and limitations post MI. Additionally, we discussed the medication free treatments she could take to improve her overall health and reduce the risk of another MI, encouraging her to participate more in incorporating exercise in her daily activity, and of course, improving her consumption, and daily foods. Lastly, we shared pain management education to assure she is aware when to seek medical attention. Oh, where's my call light? Oh, there it is. Nurse? Yes? How can I help you? Hi, Barbara. Are you, can I help you? Yeah, I just wanted to tell you that I'm feeling so much better, and I just wanted to just thank you for everything that you did for me during my stay, and really thought I was going to die and you made the experience a lot less scary for me. Well, I'm so glad that you're feeling so much better. Um, as I see, you're smiling again, so that's a good sign. Um, so I'm going to be bringing your discharge paper shortly so you can uh, go home, thankfully. And I just want to say thank you for everything for being so cooperative. And hopefully you won't have to be back soon because you'll be much better. Okay? A patient is admitted with chest pain to the ER. 
The patient has been in the ER for five hours and is being admitted to your unit for overnight observation. For the options below, what is the most important information to know about this patient at this time? Please look at the options and answer in the chat box. I will give you 30 seconds to give your answers below. The correct answer is A, troponin result and when the next troponin level is due to be collected. You're educating a patient about the causes of myocardial infarction. Which statement by the patient indicates they misunderstood your teachings and require you to re-educate them? Please put your answer below in the chat box. We will give you 30 seconds. The correct answer is B. The most common cause of a myocardial infarction is a coronary spasm from illicit drug use or hypertension.